and welcome to another edition of The Commission Files. I'm Will Leach. And I'm Kerry Gregg. Back in our beloved Studio 2 at Commission Christian Radio in Dundonald. It's had a bit of an old hoover out and a going over with the furniture polish, so it's lovely in here. It certainly is. And who was responsible for all of this? Actually, it was me in a wee moment of housekeeping frenzy. Oh, well done you. It's certainly looking spick and span. Anyway... Will and I are delighted to welcome a very special guest. I have to say we tell them all they're special guests, but then they all are. We're delighted to welcome a friend of the show. A friend of the show? It's Diane Holt of Thrive Ireland. Hi, Diane. Hello. Hello, Diane. Hello. It is so lovely to have you with us today. And I've been really looking forward to meeting you again. Over the years, our paths have crossed, but... I'm just looking forward to getting to know you in a, def- a different way. In yeah, I'm a lot today. older now. <laughs> yes, that would account for all three of us. Diane is a charity director, a trainer, an encourager, but also a podcaster, choir master, a singer, a gifted and experienced actor, and that lovely but rare combination, a dreamer and a pragmatist. We've invited you, Diane, because of what we're talking about from last time with Hyde Bank College and the Women's Prison whenever we interviewed Richard and Holly and Ruth. If you haven't heard the episode before this, do have a listen. You won't regret it. Well, it really made us think. How can churches look outwards instead of inwards? Be a part of their community rather than a part from their community. That's what Thrive is about. A way for churches and communities to be transformed. Diane, you train churches and church leaders in something called CCT. What on earth is CCT? Well, CCT stands for Church Community Transformation. And it's something that's been around for absolutely years. I suppose it started out in Africa. um, And it was Tear Fund where I first came across it, although I, I trained way back in the early 2000s. It really enables a church to work alongside and with its community, work out what their gifts and skills are, release their God-given potential and seek to work together to lift each other out of poverty. That was that was the African perspective. But here, it says it's so much more than that. I think it enables people to take space, to listen to God, to listen to each other and to listen to their local community and then together discern what what is their missional calling, what is their... Um, what is that? What is it that they can do locally to bring transformation to their local community in an integral way? So, so often the church has sort of separated out the the spiritual from the rest of the every everybody's everyday life. So, th- at the heart of it really is this understanding and developing understanding of what we call integral mission. That is, God is concerned about all aspects of our lives. He's created us as complicated human beings with not just a spiritual aspect, but, but social, economic, physical, you name it. And and really, it's about the transformation of, of all of that. Have you always had a heart for community? Yes, I suppose I have. But I mean, that's one of the questions that I always get asked, sort of, first of all, what, what is what is community? Because actually, there are so many different communities. There's our local geographical community that we live in. There's the community maybe that we work in within our, our, our environment of work. There's, if you're in a church, there's your church community. And then if you're in a, a town, maybe it's the whole town. But, you know, we have to get people to think a little bit about what do we mean when we think about community. So I suppose I was on a journey of understanding myself and ended up in that because I suppose I got a small push from God. Your small Don't. push? Come on, you have to tell us a wee bit more about this. Well... I suppose I trained as a singer and an actor and uh, that was really what I wanted to do. And it wasn't that I didn't want to use my gifts for for the church or for God, but I had never really thought of anything about engaging in community in any way or being a, and just put it in inverted commas because you can't see it on the radio, missionary. So I had started um, when I was in London, I was a member of All Souls Church and I'd been doing work here and there and everywhere and... Um, Sort of, I ended up doing work with with uh, riding lights. I was singing with the daily service. Um, I, I was being used by all souls in their prom prayers and that sort of thing. Then I got work actually back in Northern Ireland as a a, a sleeping beauty in pantomime mm-hmm. at the Arts Theatre, which doesn't even exist anymore. I remember the Arts Theatre well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I don't. I always joke, you know, uh, how do you get called by God with, while playing Sleeping Beauty <laughs> in pantomime? 
But I think I find myself in a in a world where there just weren't any Christians and certainly in the Protestant community in particular, you weren't encouraged in the creative arts to to engage. It was seen of a wor- as a world of immorality. But I just felt that people were looking for something spiritual, but they certainly weren't looking towards the church because the church was almost like what you couldn't do. You weren't allowed to have fun or in their in their eyes. So they were looking for all sorts of things. And when I finished and went back to London, I just couldn't get it out of my head. I was meant to come back in some way to to Ireland and but I didn't really want I'd been away for quite a long time at that stage and didn't really want to come back so I I wrote to um, Trevor Morrow in in looking at the time and said to him I thought I'll do this fleece test so I said look I'll you know I can I can sing and and I'm I, I, I I've trained as an actor and I'm not bad at administration is there anything you could use me for And in those days, of course, there was no email or texting or anything like that. He rang me up when he got the letter and said the church had been praying for someone um, to take over their music and uh, they needed someone to do the admin because Gwen and Monty, who's already been on a a podcast with you, uh, David Montgomery, Montgomery, uh, they were getting married and going to, to Canada. He was going to train. And he was the one who led the music in the church and Gwen was the administrator. So they were going away. And the church also said, look, we really would like to start something with drama. When can you come? And I was like, for goodness sake. (laughs) (laughs) How can you be so specific, God? (laughs) So then I I went to All Souls and they ran something called a wet feet project where you sort of put your toe in the water and say, if mission's for you. And I actually had to convince them that Ireland was a different country. (laughs) But we'll not go there. So they then sent me on what was ostensibly um, three months of mission. But I packed everything I had into my little Fiat Uno and headed off and knew that I wasn't going back. Well, that's really about getting a push and you describe it very well. When you talk about CCT, church and community transformation, we've talked about church and community, but what's the transformation you're looking for, Diane? I think it's a mindset shift really in how people understand their faith often when we we start to engage with the church so this isn't this isn't me standing at a lectern or any of the facilitators standing at a lectern and teaching people this is enabling very well developed and constructed bible study um some quite creative exercises where you're just made to think differently you know you're you're brought into the practical aspects of what the Bible teaches us about what God's intention originally was for the world. You know, God made the world to be perfect um, and then there was the fall. But actually, the story of the Bible is really God's relentless pursuit of his people back to himself. And we pray when we pray the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And actually, what does God's kingdom coming in Newton Arts, for example, where I live, look like, you know, how do we enable people to have a vision for what God's intention is for their community? And that's really what it's changing people's mindset to begin to understand the Bible in a slightly different way and to think about this integral mission, to think that God cares about all aspects of their lives. And the other thing is, you know, it, it, it also brings the joy of faith back to people again, I think. That, that's what I really enjoy about it. Mm-hmm. I'm interested that it's Bible-based. It's not just, let's go and do stuff. It's Bible-based. Why do we want to do stuff? What does the Bible teach us about what we want to be in our communities? What our calling is? And that's a big deal, isn't it? Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. And I mean, the, the church is God's chosen instrument. So, you know, God's chosen instrument for bringing transformation to the world. And the church is probably the largest voluntary organisation in the world, full of people who are capable, know their local communities well, have lots of gifts, skills and abilities. And partly the process is about unlocking those gifts, skills and abilities and the potential of the congregation and helping them to believe that they can, you know, they can engage in this way. And it's it's not as difficult as they think. When you go into a church, how do you go about this? How do you actually make the point of contact? Do the, the churches look for you? Do you sort of let people know that you're here to, to help or to engage? Tell us a wee bit about that. 
that that's actually very challenging because it's quite difficult to describe church community transformation and it's not by any means a six week lifted off a shelf course do you know that's not what it is if you're looking for mindset shift within a local congregation then it's it takes a long time for you know i suppose the penny to drop or for people to to see things slightly differently but the materials have been created over the years through theologians not not me who have who have done a lot of work on this in fact just recently there's been a lot coming from chris wright and through you know god's whole whole mission for god's whole world uh, and you know the so the materials were developed by tear fund for use originally and they were developed in africa mm-hmm. so the it, to me that's like turning mission on its head you know we think sometimes that we've got all the answers for people in in poorer parts of the world but in fact what has happened here is we have been able to contextualize stuff that was event- originally developed in africa and has been brought back here in fact the reason why it was contextualized for the uk was because a partner there said well it's really good what you're doing here for us but what are you doing in your own country and tier fund had uh, the wit to say, well, fair enough, that's absolutely right. We need to be enabling that to happen here. Mm-hmm. And uh, now it's, it's, it's really right across the world. In fact, we're working at the moment with Christians Against Poverty to enable them to roll it out much more in the UK because Tear Fund, of course, focus globally. They're yes. not focusing yes. locally anymore. So would CAP and some of the other trusts, would they contact you then and, and ask you to come and sort of... No, I have been a lone voice crying in the wilderness, actually. Right. Okay. <laughs> She starts crying. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But 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 you know, for such a time as this, it mm-hmm. seems to me that the time is is coming now that when people are really very interested. Because recently, although I was trained back in two thousand and and actually Tear Fund originally did have a team in the UK, and um, that that team um, didn't exist from about twenty fifteen. And Thrive Ireland was formed. It was birthed mm-hmm. out of Tear Fund. Mm-hmm specifically to rule out church community transformation locally but when it's only one little person like like me and actually it, it's a concept that people aren't necessarily understanding then it does take a long time to get a foothold mm. so yes individual churches have approached me but actually there's been a huge interest from secular organizations that really understand something which we would call, they call asset-based community development. But in fact, church community transformation is asset-based community development. It's just from a Christian perspective and rooted in in Bible teaching so that churches can understand it too. So they were actually supporting me to roll it out in rural communities here Mm -hmm. in Northern Ireland. Uh, And now CAP have totally caught the vision of it and have felt that God's calling them to move from just dragging people out of the pool where people are drowning in debt to looking up river to see how can we bring that holistic transformation that stops people getting into debt in the first place, that stops people needing food banks in the first place. Mm-hmm. That sounds great. But as I said at the beginning, you're a pragmatist as well as a dreamer. So first meeting, where do you even start? You go into a room with a, some kind of leader and a group of Christians. What do you do? Well, there's probably a few meetings before that, you know, where you're helping them to get get a bit of an understanding. We we seek to envision we seek to envision people about what it is that we're attempting to do. So we help them to understand a little bit about the the theology behind uh, God's intention, what I've already talked about there. But we then just give them a flavour of the type of Bible study that we would enable them to experience. So, for example. One of the Bible studies that that we use would be Elisha and the widow, because often when I go to a small church, they think, look, we've nothing. You know, we we really don't have anything. We could never do this, you know. So Elisha and the widow, um, if you remember the story, uh, the the boys are being, her boys are being sold into slavery. And, uh, you know, she goes to Elisha, who's who, who she's su- supporting really and putting up in her house at the time, and and tells him the whole story. So she, she's very clear about that, and and he he does doesn't just say let's pray about it. He very specifically tells her to do certain things, and he tells her to go to all of her neighbours to get as many jars as she possibly can and to bring them back to the house. He asks her what she has in her hand, and she has this small jug of oil. So he says, right, we're going, to, we're going to use that. He said, bring those jars. And then the oil is poured and the jars are filled until 
the very last jar is filled and when it runs out, he tells her to go and sell it in the marketplace. And she doesn't just get enough to buy her boys out of slavery. She gets enough to buy her boys out of slavery and for them to survive and thrive in the community in which they are. So we just help people to recognise all the resources that she has been told to use. So of course there's the spiritual where Elisha prays to God and the miracle happens. But there's also her willingness to be vulnerable and talk about the problems that she has. There's the health and strength of her boys who are willing to go out. There's the social networks of her neighbours where they're willing to actually go and, and all her friends are willing to help her. They're willing to lend her all those jars. There's the, the, the house that she lives in where she can do the, the business of filling the oil into the jars. And then there's the economic marketplace where she can go and sell it. And all of those things are important in what she is told to do by Elisha. And I think that's just one small example of a Bible study that people are really amazed. Gosh, yes, I never looked at it in that way before. I can see from what you're saying, you're planting the seeds, you're giving them the essence of community and faith working hand in hand and inspiring them really to to really realise that they can actually do this. So, So the work that you're doing, whenever we think of Jesus, he was always out in the community. He was always reaching out to people. It's not about what the church can do to the community or what the church can do in the community. It's about the people in the church realising that at the same time they are also members of their local community and that God is already out there working and they need to find out and join in with what God's doing. And it's working alongside and with their community So that's quite challenging initially, and I think that's why it's a long journey and a process. Mm -hmm. I want to ask about that particular part of the process, because the community, whether the church is there or not, has lots of expertise and people doing stuff and and charities and organisations. And it's not about, you know, duplicating them. It's about saying, can we work with them and, and use their expertise and their knowledge, isn't it? Absolutely. In fact, we're 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 trying to enable the church to celebrate the things that they're already really good at and to to not recognise just only what the church as a group of people are good at, but what individuals within that church are good at. So part of the process is a skills and gifts and passions audit, but it's also um, enabling them to, to build on what they're already good at. So it may be that the church doesn't start a new thing, but it builds on something it's already doing but needs to think a little bit more about. Or in some cases, it enables a church to think about what it's been doing for years but really isn't doing anything anymore because, you know, things have changed Mm -hmm. and giving the church the... I suppose the courage to maybe stop doing something that it's been doing for a long time. Especially, I think, with COVID obviously happening over the last number of years... I think it has changed communities' outlooks and and how much we need people whenever you were going through the isolation. So as as you're saying, Diane, it's very much a case of we are the community, so how can the church impact it in a better way than that it maybe might have done previously? Yes, yes. And and I mean, to be honest, less than 10% of every congregation do 100% of the work. So how do we unlock and enable and build the confidence and potential of those people who at the moment don't feel they have anything to contribute. Um, and that that's another thing that we try and help within this. I think that's interesting. If we look back to our last episode, and um, we really, Kerry, I know, did enjoy doing it. We were talking about Hyde Bank. Yes, College, I know, I listened to prison. it, I loved it. Fascinating information from Ruth and from Richard and from Holly. But what St. Phil Road Presbyterian in that case did was draw a, you know, a circle on the map round where the church was and look out and think, who could we be engaging with? And we have an example that I want to go to, which is in Fermanagh, where there's a group of four churches. Lisbelaw, Listnesky, Maguire's Bridge, Newton Butler. One minister more than his work cut out for him, yes. and that's Rodney Beacom. But you have engaged with that church. They're certainly not finished, but they have started on the journey. Now, we're going to hear from them in just a moment, but tell us a little bit about them. Oh, that was such fun. I mean, it was, in fact, the Rural Community Network that that funded this process of enabling them to join. And, in fact, they've joined with other churches, uh, including in a skill in Presbyterian and Balna Mallard Methodist, um, although they're, they're not on the, on the clips that you're going to hear. But really, for them, it was, it was a journey of 
finding out. We, I was training their facilitators. So we initially train facilitators in, in the churches who then I mentor through facilitating the whole process that I train them in through their own churches. We, we met, I think, for six sessions where we went through really, there's a process is stop, look, listen, walk. That's the process. And the stop and the look takes place mostly within your congregation. And it's exactly what we've just been talking about, you know, stopping to listen to God and to listen to each other and then taking time to reflect on and celebrate what we're already good at. And then um, look at what is in our hand. Um, And that's the process we've taken them on so far. And they're a they're about to, they've launched it in the church and they're about to start those sessions. This is a bottom-up approach. This is not um, the minister telling the congregation or a small group of people doing it for the congregation. This is them facilitating the congregation to go through the process themselves and to make the decisions for themselves so that everybody has a say and that everybody participates in the process. Uh, and they're, they're excited about it, as I hope you hear when you play the clips. Right, let's hear from Rodney, Anita, Barbara, Laura, Libet and Desi. Church and community transformation, getting people involved in thinking about who we are and what we're going to do. That's what Jesus did. He didn't just have one building where he was in and everybody came to see him. He went out to see everybody else. So why should we, the church be any different? We've realised that we're much more gifted and talented than we actually thought we were. So there are so many endless ideas that you can have. Um, we just need creative and willing people. In a way it was to get us to think a little bit outside of the box and to get us maybe to step outside of our comfort zone. I suppose you know, that it would be sort of someone stand in front of you with slideshows and maybe sitting down filling out forms or whatever, but it was completely different from that. I really enjoyed it. You knew there were problems, maybe you didn't realise that there were so many in your local small village. The light bulb moment for me was that we can actually link into our community and what's available to us in our community and how we can interact with that and use that for the good of the community and for the good of us as a congregation as well. See what help there is out there with organisations that maybe you can tune into that you never thought, well, do we have somebody that specialises in that? Is there a a charity or is there a a special person that deals with that? Other elders were coming to me to find out what we were doing with this transformation project and They were giving me ideas about what they were doing and that excites me that it's not just our church, there are other churches thinking about this process as well. We did it together with different churches so I got to meet other people and all like-minded people who all have their own visions and I think that's really good because you've got lots of ideas and suggestions. It's not all about us Um, and even though we are small there's a place for us and there's still something we can do if we use what is around us and a link into what's in the communities around us. If we could only get this seed of church and community transformation planted and if people could see how powerful the potential is there to spread out, it, it would be great. Well, thanks to all six for sharing their thoughts. How encouraging is that, Diane? Is that a pretty typical response from folk once they've made a start on the journey? Yes, it is actually, because I think they're, they arrive the first night and they have no idea what to expect. And, you know, I remember some of the ones that you've just been interviewing saying they were expecting me to just talk and they had to be there for three hours and they were going, what on earth are we going to do? Lots of note-taking and L- very yes, pointy-headed, exactly. they and said, yes. And it just wasn't like that. And they got to engage with each other. They got to build relationships across the churches. But they had lots of fun and lots of laughter as well. And, you know, sometimes we don't always expect that when we go to stuff that's to do with church or mission. And yet that was something that really stood out for them. But I'm excited because they're excited and they can see the real potential. And, you know, it's been it's been a real joy getting to know them because they've got, you know, rural communities have got very different challenges. Um, and especially when you're, you know, a minister that has four different congregations. But one of the things they've learned is, you know, 
they need to take some responsibility. It's not just about what the minister can do, but it's about them together enabling this Mm -hmm. to happen. So actually, now they're launching it and Rodney is absolutely and totally involved, but he doesn't have to drive it. Mm -hmm. And it's that bringing together that's important, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And you can hear that enthusiasm Mm -hmm. in their voices. These are people who, who, by their own admission, were slightly nervous at the start of it. And as Rodney said, we didn't think we could do anything. We discovered we could do lots. And we've discovered that there are organisations out there and there's discovered that a community that is perfectly happy to engage. Uh, And they're very proud, for example, of a float they did at one stage through one of the villages and organised themselves. And you can see that. It's saying, here we are, here's who we are. Here's our journey with God, mm. but it's a journey it's, as part of your community. Yeah, thinking outside the box. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. But also, I think, you know, churches can be quite siloey. So, you know, even those churches that are larger, people maybe are ministering in the youth, youth side of things, but maybe there's another group of people doing senior citizen stuff, and then there's people doing this and that. But not everybody knows what everybody does. And when we do the launch, you're celebrating everything your church does. And I think one of the things that when I spoke to Rodney after they'd done their launch, he was so happy and excited and encouraged because there was so much going on. And I think everybody said, we just didn't realise what we could do. You know, when he says in that clip, you know, we didn't realise how many gifts and skills and abilities we had. And that's it. It's helping people to discover stuff that just didn't know, even though they are doing good stuff. You're listening to The Commission Files. We're going to take a quick break. He was a prince in Egypt, or so he thought. Mother! Ben has told me I'm not your son. Is that true? Then he met God in a burning bush. I am the God of your father, your father Abraham, the founder of your people, Moses. I have heard the misery of my people in Egypt. I have come down to set them free. And he made enemies. Do you take me for a fool? Get out of my sight! He led his people to freedom. We, the people of God, will pass through. But he faced rebellion from those he loved. Listen to my words. To my servant Moses I speak plainly. Why have you spoken against him? Have you not realized that I am with him and will not have him spoken against? Commission presents Moses, My Brother, a Bible drama in 13 parts, available online at commissionradio.org. We're back with The Commission Files. And we're chatting with Diane Holt of Thrive Ireland. Diane, you were director of the Lincoln Newton Arts for 15 years. How did that prepare you for what you're doing now? Well, yeah, it, it certainly did. I have to say, you know, can can you imagine coming back from being trained as a singer and an actor, then working in all the arts stuff. And then this minister just kept ringing me up from uh, Regent Street Presbyterian Newton Arts and going, Diane, you're the right person to head up this idea of community project he had. There was nothing. They had a shop front and nothing else. Didn't have a name. And actually, it was only because my dad was diagnosed with cancer that I came back at all. And I thought, oh, I'll do this for a year. And, you know, it was a journey of the steepest learning curve in the entire world. And everybody who gets involved, I think, in this type of of ministry, often, you know, I listened actually to Archdeacon Robert Miller say exactly the same thing. We had absolutely no idea initially what we were doing. But God knew what he was doing. And I think if we can hang on to that and know that we're not doing stuff like this on our own. But I think it was it was a learning curve of understanding not just the the way that we need to engage with the local community in the importance of building trust and relationships over a long period of time, but I think it was also the learning from other organisations that I connected with, you know, whether it was the Church Community Work Alliance who help you to reflect theologically on why you're doing and what you're doing, because you're constantly trying to connect what you feel you need to do in community with what your faith is. And that's actually, there was no there was no handbook for that. There wasn't a lot of theology around that that I could find, which is why church community transformation theology is so helpful in enabling you to know the why behind why you're doing stuff. But it was total and utter preparation. So, you know, we worked with people with chronic addictions to alcohol, marginalised young people. We worked in the 
the different estates around around the town. And it was building relationships and authentic relationships, not just relationships where we're only doing this so that you'll come to faith. Because at the end of the day, I deeply believe that we bring the presence of Christ in us into every situation that we have. But the person who converts is God. The person who reveals himself to people is God. We can only do our best in the situation in bringing Christ. And it can be through words, but it can also be through who we are in Christ in the situation, in the care and the love and the concern that we bring to those people. I'm sure the challenges that you also met with during that time would have really been a bedrock then for the future then for you? Well, I would I would hope so. <laughs> And, and say, also what probably, not to do. It probably toughened you up a bit. <laughs> it definitely toughened toughened me up a bit. I was actually re- reminiscing on, um, you know, and actually one of the things that sticks in my mind is how important it is sometimes to be vulnerable because I remember one night, and it was a particularly difficult evening, although there were many times of laughter. I could tell you so many stories, but we'll not go there. Um, but guys were in, they were playing their flutes. They decided that they were going to march around the the drop-in centre playing their flutes and then on top of the pool table as well and the youth worker god lover she could not you know she couldn't really get control and in the end she just sat down and cried and that was what stopped them and I sometimes think that you know we think we're in control but in fact it is the vulnerability it's because they did actually care about her and they knew that she cared about them that stopped them being so I suppose obnoxious at the time you know, because they were just looking for the anger and the the other reaction. Mm-hmm. But that vulnerability is so important and so not shown at, at times because we're so trying to hold that control. So, I mean, there's lots of things that we're taught. And I'm not saying I'm very good at it yet, but, you know, at least there's learning there. Mm-hmm. It's a testament to you that the link still continues now in Newton Arts and, and has thrived. And so... So you must be doing something right, Diane. <laughs> well, it's certainly it's certainly doing a good job now. And we've done some partnership stuff with The Link in the last couple of years as well. We, we've, we've done some brilliant stuff. And so Mark Houston there is, is doing a great job. You've thrown in a couple of times and we've got to explore this a little bit. You were trained, Diane, as an actor and a singer. You're used to being on stage, showing off. Now, you and I have worked together on a podcast and I have seen your wee dramatic moments. <laughs> yes, indeed. Tell us about the being on stage. I, I know it's jumped down the generations. Your daughter's doing exactly that now. But what made you want to do that? I just blame my parents, really. Well, especially my mother, who I think probably always wanted to, um, you know, to do that sort of thing and then never really had the opportunity. So, you know, at the age of four, I was taken to singing lessons. But apparently I did stand on tables and sing at that stage. But then when I was seven, the, um, the little theatre in Bangor advertised for children for The Sound of Music. And although you had to be nine and I was only seven, she took me. <laughs> and lo and behold, I was cast as Gretel. So there was the no going... Little the littlest one, yes. <laughs> so there was no going back from that. Uh, and then I got involved in, in acting at Sullivan when I was at Sullivan. And, uh, I still know all the words. Of what? The Sound of Music? Yeah. Yeah, oh, oh, pretty well, yeah. I could probably sing all of the songs. We could actually do a duet, probably, Diane. Yeah, no problem, Carrie. So we'll do that for another podcast. Because I love our listeners. We're not doing that. (laughs) But how do you know that? They might just love it. (laughs) No, I'm thinking about the licensing. It should be hugely complicated. So uh, stay safe, publishers. We're not doing it. Um, So you wanted to be on stage. You wanted to sing. What is it that that... Because you're on stage all the time now when you're running a room of people and training them and and giving them a vision and and mentoring them. How much is that performance element important to you? I mean, there there is a bit of performance in it, but actually the thing about being a facilitator is, and I have to hold myself back all the time, you're trying to enable other people to speak. You're trying to enable other people to give their opinions. You're trying to tease out the quietest person in the room so that everybody gets an opportunity. So how much do you hold yourself back? Because the actor, that's alien to them, surely. I know, I know, I do. I I really do have to check it. (laughs) I do, (laughs) I do. But actually, it's the other part, you know, it's the... I don't think people realise in communication there's a lot of influencing involved, you know, and one of the things that we help 
some of like you know I do some leadership stuff as well, but one of the things we help people to do is to realize how important communication is. So if you want to make a difference in the world, you need to be a good good communicator. And 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 there is something about how that impacts people. So when whenever we're envisioning or whenever we're communicating with people, I know it's important to use stories because I can tell you everything you want about how I do stuff, but that's pretty boring. So actor and singer, and when I was a student, they would come to me in my church and say, do one of your dramas, would you? And I would immediately go to a little paperback book I had, which was Writing Light Sketches. And this is the most exciting thing I've discovered. You toured with Writing Lights. Yes, and I believe you put one of our cast up whenever we were on tour because it's because we... he was a celeb and way more famous than you <laughs> yes he was it was it was in fact Robert Duncan from Drop the Dead Donkey Gus oh, the yes. character <laughs> who doesn't actually have any friends yes um, at one point he stayed in my landlord and friend's house and we got to chat because Riding Lights were playing in the town where I was living so what was that like doing that kind of sketch it was brilliant format. fun it was absolutely brilliant fun and that was a show where they literally knit all the, ske- the sketches together into a story sort of starting from creation right through and uh, b- but it's really hard work it is really hard work so you we spent three weeks in New York or four weeks in New York you know rehearsing for the for the show and then went on tour in a minibus of 49 different venues and 72 performances and we were staying with host families like yourself in every single town that we we went to so you know Many times we're, we're, we're sitting down after the show and the, the host family's going, so what do you really do? Like, this is what I really do. <laughs> Are you ever going to get a proper job? Yes. yes. Do you... Well, I did. I did. I'm just saying I did. I'm telling you about it now. <laughs> do you miss being able to do the acting and the singing? Or do you still do a wee bit mm. every now and again? I think the older you get as a woman singer, more than as a man singer, the less people ask you. So... I don't really do as much. I have, I do have a community choir, which I absolutely love, although I'm taking a little bit of a sabbatical at the moment because life is so busy with Thrive and, and work and various other things. But I'll be back again next year with my choir. Tell me a I little would, bit about that. Choir where? How oh, many? Ard's Voice Community Choir. And you, you, anybody can belong to Ard's Voice Community Choir. It's, you, it's about really just the joy of singing and the healing powers, I think, of singing and, you know, music. So we would have a lot of people who maybe have been told at primary school that they haven't a note in their head, but actually they really do and mm-hmm. they can sing, but they've probably been put off for life. So um, it's a very mixed choir, but great fun. There's a lot of laughter and they're not bad at all, I have to say. Mm-hmm. In fact, they're, my, my friend Claire is now taking them for a year and uh, they're doing the festival in Bangor this Saturday. So um, mm-hmm. I'll be going to see them and cheer them along. I deliberately asked you about that because that's a kind of leadership that's a directing thing outside the charity community stuff you're doing, although, of course, it's connected. But you care about people being inspired and stepping up and taking the lead in something. And I know you used to work, and in many ways still do day and daily, in inspiring individuals. You had an inspired individuals programme. What was that? How did that help people? Because a lot of the people you're working with now came through that programme. I worked in the Inspired Individuals programme with cohorts in Africa and I'm still working with cohorts in East and Southeast Asia. So I'm still working with inspiring and inspired leaders all over the world. But I had the opportunity to do two cohorts here. And uh, yeah, no, it was it's really good. So the whole concept behind it is that the focus is on the individual, not on what they do. And so you're caring about holistically about all sorts of aspects of their life. You know, you care about... Um, their mental health and their physical health and you know so it, it, it's it's a real joy you bring them into groups of people who are doing really I suppose mostly we focus on people who are doing quite challenging ministries that the church doesn't always understand and maybe because of that then they feel quite isolated and alone so when you bring them into groups of people who are doing similar ministries it helps them to have that sense of belonging and family and um, and then there's training provided, coaching and mentoring and pastoral care. And it's just a lovely experience of of joining with a group of people for a period of time and enabling them to to step into 
whatever ministry God's created them to to, to be in, but in a much more supported and holistic way. Mm-hmm. With the international aspect of your work as well, I'm sure that has just been a joy. <laughs> yes, it is, although... Uh, on my last trip to Indonesia, oh, which, start. Oh. which was in March, it was the texts it, I got. It was very long. <laughs> yeah, so I was in Amman right uh, uh-huh. the week before and working with a church in because I've been helping to contextualize CCT for the churches in the Middle East. So then I was back for a whole three days, and then I went to Indonesia, and it was a twenty-four hour journey on the planes, three of them, and then I had a night in Jakarta, and then a ten-hour coach journey to go to Salatigo, which is where we were doing the training. So I don't as much <laughs> now that I'm older enjoy that aspect as much as I did, um, but the people are incredible, and you know it's it's just brilliant. Um, so, and it, it it brings so much learning for me, that I can then utilise within Thrive Ireland. So to me, keeping those connections is really important. And often people can hear things from a different perspective from another country, and it touches them in a way that if you talk about it from a local perspective here in Northern Ireland, particularly around peace and reconciliation, actually people will get it, say, somewhere like Rwanda or somewhere like Cambodia, but, but and they'll hear a story from there and they'll go, that's just like here. And, and then God will speak to them through that. So I'm always trying to bring learning from other places. We have to remind folk that there is Inspired to Act, a podcast that you and I have made. Series one has eight episodes and you search it on the same platform as you find this. And we did a lot of focus on reconciliation work, but it was fascinating to see communities and people engaging with their communities and just making change. So you are making a difference. You do know that, don't you? <laughs> well, I hope so. But sometimes you do feel like you're banging your head off the wall. <laughs> but I mean, I, 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 I think in the last year or so, I feel that there is something happening around this, you know, that there is more interest, that, that, that others are, are beginning to join in, that others are beginning to understand more. And, you know, I don't feel quite as alone as I did. But I think... We're, we're getting there and and I, I just want more people to, to join in and understand. Just listening to you, Diane, and I can just see how you your face lights up when you talk about community, when you talk about faith. Why is your faith so important to you? It just is. <laughs> it just is. I mean, what can, it, what can I say? You know, I mean, I've seen what God can do and I've had incredible opportunities to see what God can do in other places things that there's no human understanding for. Do you know what I mean? And I've I've watched God do amazing things through his people. But if I work in a secular setting, there is something that I think we have in terms of Christianity. That I, you know, I hate to call it the X factor because we always think about that program, but it is that. There's something that is missing and you can see that it's missing for people. But they're not hearing it in the right way at the moment. That that it's com- that it's it's coming that, that God has anything to do with it, or that the church would have anything to say to them. So, I think the challenge is those authentic, one to one people relationships with, with other Christian people where who Christ is living in. Dan, thanks so much for coming in to see us. It's not like you don't know your way around Studio 2 here, but we've put you in the big guest chair this time, which is a bit of a different old experience for you. You've coped brilliantly. Thank you. It's been fascinating. Thank you so much, Diane. It really has been wonderful just chatting with you today. Thanks for listening. We're made at the studios of Commission Christian Radio and Dundonald. Check us out at commissionradio.org and take a look at our Facebook page. Search for Commission Broadcast Centre. Do encourage others to listen and follow us. If you feel led, write a review. And don't forget our sister podcast that Diane and Will have been doing, Inspired to Act from Thrive Ireland. More details about that at thriveireland.org. And we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.